Well, I guess I guess we're back on. Our uh, next uh, guest is Dr. Alan Cole. Uh, for folks that joined us in April for our little conference, you will probably remember Alan. He was one of our presenters in that. Um, Dr. Cole is the deputy to the president for societal challenges and opportunities at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, he also serves as a professor in, at, in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work and professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Dell Medical School. Um, Dr. Cole Allen was diagnosed in 2016 at the age of 48 with young onset Parkinson disease. So uh, his uh, uh, experience goes beyond just knowing, you know, from reading and studying, it's actually experiential. Um, Dr. Cole graduated uh, from Davidson College, Columbia University, and Princeton Theological Seminary. And prior to his current position, he was the academic dean and professor of pastoral care at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Uh, I'm, I'm not so good at introductions, sorry. <laughs> there's just so much, there's so much here. We could take up the whole hour with just all the things that you do and have done. Um, Alan is the creator and uh, moderator for uh, PDYs. If you haven't been there, it's a website uh, that was created for folks with Parkinson's to share experiences and um, ideas about living with Parkinson disease. There's a lot of creative writing, which is fantastic um, for folks that, you know, like to do that. Um, uh, Alan has participated in programs with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Davis Finney Foundation. So he's become quite well known in, the, in our broader Parkinson's community. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alan. And thanks so much again for coming and being a part of our program. Well, thank you for having me, David. Thank you for those gracious words. And uh, it's always good to, to be with you all. I uh, appreciated um, Dr. Lasker's talk very much. And, and I, I think and I, I, I hope that what I say will sort of dovetail nicely with what he's said already, which again is very impressive and very informative. So I'll jump right into it. I um, want to again say thank you to the Parkinson's Foundation in Western Pennsylvania. This is my second time with you all and I was very excited to be asked to come back. Um, let me get to my slides here and begin with sort of naming some assumptions that I'll be working with today and, and the information and the experiences that I'm sharing with you. Um, the first thing that I always want to say is that, that we're more than Parkinson's. And so if we receive a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, whether you're 48, like uh, was true for me, or at another phase of life, uh, I think it's important to, to know that as consuming as that diagnosis can be and often is for us, that we remain more than our disease. It doesn't uh, have to define us. It doesn't have to exhaust who we are. Parkinson's is also what we often call a snowflake disease or a disease of one, meaning if you know someone with Parkinson's, you know that person and his or her experience perhaps, but um, it's a, a disease that's not homogeneous. It's uh, very different in some ways across people. Um, there are symptoms we share in common, but uh, the way it manifests itself can, can be very different among people, uh, which is to say we all have different stories of living with Parkinson's disease. And, and one of the things that I enjoy very much about the work I do, whether it's with PDYs or in speaking uh, on occasions like this, 
meeting physicians like uh, Dr. Lasker and others whose life work is trying to uh, not only treat uh, this illness, but also to, to find better treatments and cures. Uh, all of that is meaningful to me because it allows me to uh, listen to different people's stories with Parkinson's to tell my own. And I think that um, sharing our stories helps all of us, whether we're telling them or hearing them to live better with, with Parkinson's. So uh, those are the assumptions that I'll be working with. And um, again, look forward to telling you more about my story, but, but also in the Q&A uh, to broadening it to others' experiences as well. So as David mentioned, I was diagnosed uh, five years ago, uh, just a few weeks ago was my uh, five year moment with uh, a diagnosis of Parkinson's. I was 48 years old, uh, have two daughters. They were 10 and eight at the time. I've been married uh, about 25 years. And um, you know, the first thing I did, which I don't recommend was I retreated into uh, a very silent, place in my life uh, where my wife knew about my diagnosis, my physicians, of course, knew about it. One or two very close, trusted friends knew about it. Uh, my parents didn't know, my children didn't know, my network of support, whether that be professional or personal, didn't know, my boss didn't know. Um, and for me, the, the suffering in suffering, if you will, with Parkinson's became uh, much more difficult to manage than living with the illness itself. And so after about 11 months, I uh, took the step, uh, step and became public with my illness. Um, and since that time, I've, I've tried to uh, use my experiences and, and my experience as an educator in particular to not only raise awareness and educate people, uh, but to uh, also help remove some of the stigma attached to Parkinson's and some of the misperceptions, frankly, that uh, continue to operate around this, this experience. Which is also to say that disclosure is always a personal choice. I know people who uh, disclose their illness immediately, and that's right for them. Others take months and, and even years, and that's all right uh, as well. That's what they need to do. So there's not a one size fits all. But I know in my own experience, um, I wish if I had it to do again, that I had shared my experience more fully earlier in the process, because again, for me, uh, not doing it uh, added uh, a, a deal of, a great deal of suffering to, to my experience overall. So one of the things I was asked to talk about uh, today is, is meaning making and, and then religion and spirituality and social work. As David mentioned, I have a background both educationally and, and professionally in sort of the intersections of uh, clinical and, and psychological uh, thinking and experience, uh, as well as what we might call spiritual or religious or theological um, perspectives as well. So I'm going to try to speak out of those uh, intersections, if you will, uh, in my time with you today. And for me, um, when I think about meaning making, uh, it was important to, to sort of begin with what I call a, a mindset for having uh, any experience, but in this case, Parkinson's disease at the age of 48 years old. And here's some things that, that I learned um, and, and I offer up to you for uh, consideration as, as you are making meaning with uh, your own experiences with, with Parkinson's. So I think a good question to ask uh, in thinking about sort of what mindset you might adopt in, in living with Parkinson's is a, a question like, you know, who am I? Who do I understand myself to be as a person? And, and how does having Parkinson's in this case affect that? Uh, presumably um, a diagnosis of a, a progressive, uh, currently uh, uncurable disease would, would bring into question all sorts of things, but questions of identity or place in the world, i.e. who am I, for me was one of the big ones. And then a, a closely related question was, you know, who do I want to be now that I have this, um, this, this new deck of cards uh, before me to hark back to uh, Dr. Lasker's um, quote, uh, who do I want to be now? Uh, this is the hand I've been dealt. Um, currently, there's there's, there's not a cure. There are ways to live 
better with Parkinson's and less well with Parkinson's, knowing all of that, who do I want to be? And of course, closely related to the first two questions is the third, what are my values and my priorities? What do I really care about? How do I want to spend my time, my resources, my energy? Um, now that I know that I'm going to be living with something for presumably a long time, maybe forever, it's going to impact my life, my family's life, uh, the people I care about's lives. Um, what are my values and my priorities? I think these are, by the way, questions we should all be asking um, anyway, but I, my point is when you have a diagnosis like Parkinson's, at least for me, uh, these questions came to the fore. And then after sort of lingering on or in these questions for some time, I began to, to sort of ask the so what question. Um, what do I want to do in light of how I answer the mindset questions? How does who I am and who I want to be and what my values and priorities uh, are, how does that affect what I want to do, how I want to live my life, et cetera? And so some questions within the larger questions were, were these, how do I maintain hope? Uh, Parkinson's doesn't get better, uh, it's progressive. There are things that we can do to manage it and for a long period of time, we can manage it well, but eventually it gets worse. Uh, how do you maintain hope when you know that you're going to be living with something, um, presumably for a long time, that's only going to get worse? That was important for me to, to spend some time on. Again, for me, how do I use Parkinson's for good in the world? Um, I, I'm wired in a way that uh, I've, I've always tried to live my life in um, a way that suggests that, um, you know, bad things happen to people. Um, asking what good can come of them doesn't make them any less bad, but it adds a, a meaning again, at least for me, uh, to the experience that otherwise would be lacking. So for me, the question became, how can I use Parkinson's constructively for, for doing good, not only in my life and the lives of those I love most, but, but perhaps in the broader community? And then again, how do I spend my time and other resources in these, in these efforts toward meaning making? Along with what I discerned was important to Embrace, there were some things that I quickly discovered were important for me to avoid. So I wanna talk about some of that too. Uh, one thing was living stuck in the past. I think it can be very uh, enticing when you um, know that your future is going to be uh, not only different, but presumably more complicated than your past, um, that we, we end up sort of stuck in the past and, and nostalgic perhaps for the way life quote unquote used to be. Uh, and with that can come, you know, feelings of loss and even uh, anxiety and depression. And it's important, let me be sure to say this, that we, that, that we um, look closely at, at what we've lost and that we allow ourselves to, to grieve and to mourn. Uh, written a lot about that, which you can find more about on PDYs. So I'm not saying we don't, uh, we, we don't, um, you know, allow ourselves to, to grieve or to mourn what we've lost. But my point is, if we get stuck there, then we miss out on the opportunity to engage in the kind of meaning making that I'm trying to make a case for. Um, which is to say, too much focus on how I used to be can get in the way of how I can be today and perhaps tomorrow as well as a person who has Parkinson's, yes, but who can also um, use that experience for uh, for good and for even joyous and life-giving experiences. Don't focus on what I can no longer do. Uh, don't allow oneself to uh, go it alone. Uh, surround yourself with, with people who not only care about you, but people whom you can learn from in the Parkinson's community. Uh, so don't avoid any of, of that um, or avoid any of that and avoid living too far in the future. I'll say a lot more about all of these here in a moment. Which is to say that I learned to embrace personal agency. There's a lot that I can do as a man with Parkinson's, in some ways better than I did before I had Parkinson's, I've discovered. Um, which is to say, I don't have to check my, my agency, my ability to do things at the door, um, but, but maybe just reevaluate 
my personal agency and determine how to use it going forward. Um, Parkinson's brings you face to face with accepting the fact that there are lots of things in life that you cannot control. That's my experience. I like to be able to control as much as I can. Uh, and Parkinson's has been humbling in that way, but I've also discerned that I, I maintain selective control. And uh, in some ways, selective control is, is more life-giving for me than uh, being fully in control. And then the power of community, um, the Parkinson's community, I know I will be preaching to the choir on this call, but is an extraordinary community. Um, and embracing that community to the fullest is something that, that I learned is, is life-giving. Um, and then uh, again, the strength of, um, of, of, of will. I think you know, part of um, making meaning in life uh, with Parkinson's is, is willing yourself to stay active, to stay involved, to stay engaged, to stay, stay purposeful. Uh, many of the things that Dr. Lasker talked about, I think for me relate to, the, to, to, to one strength of will. And then, of course, spiritual values and commitments, which I'll talk a lot more about here in just a few moments. So things to avoid and things to embrace. For me, and maybe for you, the, the journey uh, has to begin with acceptance. And I think um, that looks different for different people. It's, it's timetable unfolds differently for uh, different people. But I, I, I'm convinced that we have to accept our diagnosis and have to accept what goes with that if we are going to uh, begin to make meaning in the experience and if we are going to in fact live as well as we could with, um, with, with Parkinson's. There's a great quote from Michael J. Fox that I often uh, note when I talk about acceptance. He said that acceptance doesn't mean resignation. It simply means understanding that something is what it is and that there's got to be a way through it. And for me, starting there is, is, is uh, first key to any meaning making in this experience. I think our outlook is really important too. Um, how we approach a life with any adversity, I think Parkinson certainly included, has a lot to do with, with how we sort of move through that experience, which is to say how we frame the, um, the experience, if you will, has a, a long way to, has a lot to say about how we see it or view it within that frame. For me, gratitude has been really important. Um, there's a lot to be grateful for despite having Parkinson's. I think Parkinson's made me more aware of uh, the many things in my life for which I can and should be grateful and has only added to my store of gratitude as I've uh, met incredible people doing uh, remarkable things while they're living with this illness, including people like Dr. Lasker and other healthcare providers who devote their life's work uh, to, to the cause. The community again, um, and then educating ourselves. I, I commend all of you for being here today, um, whether it's learning about palliative care or meaning making or anything else you might uh, benefit from. I think for me, making meaning in Parkinson's requires ongoing education. Um, and I hope that will be something that's, that's um, the case for you too. I also think discipline is important. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the context of religion and spirituality or, or religious or spiritual disciplines, if you will. But, but I think, uh, at least for me, uh, maintaining a regimen of exercise and eating well and practicing um, meditation or prayer or mindfulness, whatever one practices, uh, putting so, oneself in relationship to others in community as opposed to isolation. All of those things require uh, discipline, a, a commitment that's um, renewed each day, perhaps, to, to doing those things. Otherwise, we can sort of fall off of our routines. Goal setting for me has been very important. A lot of people I talk to with Parkinson's, and, and this includes me in the early months of my experience, you know, assume that, that all the goals that I had for myself and my, my family and my career, all of that had to be, you know, uh, put on hold or, or just let go of. Um, and in fact, that's, that's not the case at all. Some, some goals have to be reformulated, perhaps um, nuanced a bit. But my experience has been uh, not only that we, that we can continue to have goals, but that we should have 
uh, should continue to have goals because uh, having goals and trying to meet them, I think is, is part of being human, which is another way of saying that we need to uh, identify and reclaim our purpose each day. Uh, and for me, humor has been very important in making meaning. My, my family and I are, are sort of wired for humor. Uh, and we even uh, have a lot of humor around Parkinson's disease, which isn't to say that having Parkinson's is, is funny per se, but there are lots of moments and um, opportunities to practice humor, which for me is, is not only life giving, but palliative uh, as well. So let me say a little bit um, about religious faith and spirituality, because I was asked um, by the staff to, to talk about that today. And it, again, it fits well with my background. Um, here's a quote that, that's meaningful to me that I'll, I'll uh, share with you. It's by Thomas Merton, who was a 20th century contemplative uh, monk, uh, if you will, um, who, who said, uh, you, you do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it is all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith, and hope. And, and for me, I, I've studied a lot of religious traditions and spiritual traditions throughout the years. And, and for me, this is a sort of a nice way of, um, of, of inviting people into that experience, wherever they come from, wherever they may be interested in going. Um, we don't need to know precisely what's happening in our lives or exactly where it's all going, but only to recognize possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith, and hope. Another quote that orients me, um, this is by an Austrian um, thinker, uh, Rilke, who many of you may be familiar with. He was a poet and um, writer and, and has a lot of wisdom to offer. But uh, Rilke said that, believe in a love that is being stored up for you like an inheritance. This was his sort of spirituality. And have faith that in this love, there is a strength and a blessing so large that you can travel as far as you wish without having to step outside it. So another sort of orienting religious, spiritual, meaning-making commitment that, that I practice often and that's been meaningful to me. Um, here's another uh, way of thinking about it that comes from David Brooks, who, who writes for the New York Times. Um, Brooks said the following, we're all fragile when we don't know what our purpose is. He is uh, big on purpose and has written a lot about it. When we haven't thrown ourselves with abandon into a social role, when we haven't committed ourselves to certain people, when we feel like a swimmer in an ocean with no edge. People are really tough only after they have taken a leap of faith for some truth or mission or love. Once they've done that, they can withstand a lot. And so we talk a lot in, in um, healthcare and in, in mental health, which is my field about resilience. And um, I think Brooks is really talking about resilience. Toughness is the word he uses, but he links resilience with, with having purpose and a passion for something that, that otherwise is going to be um, lacking and, 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 and contribute to not having resilience. And for me, that's been an, an important organizing sort of way of thinking about meaning making and religion and spirituality too. And then finally, another quote, and then I'll unpack some of these uh, for us. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's another sort of intellectual hero of mine, wrote that uh, we do well to do the following, quote, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. This new day is too dear with its hopes and innovations to waste a moment on the yesterdays. And so again, for me, um, thinking about the present and the, the future uh, has been more important than, than thinking about the past. So here's a very practical exercise that I do every day. And I would invite you to try it on for yourselves. You can um, adapt it any way you like. You can also tell me after this is over, Alan, this is, you know, completely meaningless to me and we'll still be friends. Um, but I think 
exercising hope is really important for meaning making in life in general, um, and, and certainly with uh, Parkinson's disease. And so I begin each day the following way. When I, when I wake up, even before I get out of bed, um, I lie there and I say the following four things at least, uh, sometimes aloud, sometimes uh, silently. Um, and I do some things with them, which I'll talk about. I say to myself, I'm grateful for another day. Here's where the gratitude comes in. Um, I'm alive. I have opportunities this day that, that I may not have uh, other days. And so naming my gratitude for that is important. Secondly, I say, I will do my best to make it good. Doesn't mean it's without challenges. It doesn't mean that some awful things may not happen during the day. Um, some things I'm anticipating or perhaps that are unknown to me, but I'm still going to do my best to make it a good day because the day is what I have. In doing that, I will try to keep a focus on my strengths, not my weaknesses or my liabilities, and I have both. And ultimately, I say to myself, I will be hopeful. And then usually I'll say these words again several times throughout the day, especially if I'm struggling. And over time, what I have discovered is that as I've practiced this sort of very basic um, discipline, I've noticed that how I think about my life with Parkinson's and how I feel about its hardships has changed. And, and not only that, that I've gotten added perspective on how to uh, manage those hardships that, that I didn't have uh, those first you know, days and weeks and months after my diagnosis. The other thing I do, uh, I write a lot. And for me, poetry uh, is very meaningful. And so um, I wrote this poem as I was inspired by a friend of mine named Gary Freeman. Gary is, is my neighbor. He's a former colleague, a professor in the government department at the University of Texas at Austin. He's a good bit older than me. And he's lived with Parkinson's for um, a long time. And we meet fairly regularly every couple of weeks, usually on his front porch. And we talk about our experiences and we talk about life with Parkinson's and we talk about the things that, that friends you know, talk about, uh, not always about Parkinson's, but, but often it's there. And so um, I wrote this poem for Gary and, and, and for you two, uh, as well as for myself that I wanna read to you um, so that, that maybe you'll have a sense of how I make meaning. Joined by neurologic woes and mutual devotion to scholarly pursuits, we meet on his front porch to remember lives before brain protein clumps arrived, when we woke, spoke, and moved smooth. Still, remembering is not all we do. We lament and debate, laugh and act young, make sense and create, speak more freely, bear souls, and live true. The memories brand new. So I share this with you because I, I think it captures what I'm trying to say about sort of new ways of living life. I never would have imagined, you know, meeting Gary and certainly visiting regularly and talking about life with Parkinson's disease. But that that experience has become a gift for me, something I look forward to. And I, I think Gary would say something similar. Um, that's a wonderful thing that has happened by virtue of having Parkinson's disease. It's not good that either of us have it. I don't think either of us would sign up for it. We would end it tomorrow if we could. And yet there's life-giving meaning, joy, happiness, solidarity, friendship uh, that has come about because of that. And um, there's not much that I can imagine trading for that, um, even with Parkinson's disease. And so this, this will give you an idea of how I sort of practice what I'm trying to um, suggest has been helpful in my life. Th this poem is, is available in a, in, in a book that was just published last week that, um, that has a collection of poetry around my experience with Parkinson's. And so I wanted to make sure you knew about that too. I also have a blog that was referenced earlier. I invite you to come visit it, it's pdwise.com. I invite you to uh, reach out to me. I, I love to hear from people. 
to share their experiences, to share more about mine, you can reach me at alan at pdwise.com. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions. I know that um, we're gonna have a conjoint Q&A after I'm through, but any, any questions or comments that you have, uh, I'd be delighted to, um, to hear from you. So thank you for your, for your time and um, look forward to visiting uh, for the rest of the hour. There I go again. As we were saying earlier, one of these days I'm going to get this all figured out. It's only been a year and a half, but we have a three-year-old dog that hasn't figured out training yet, so I guess I'm in good company. I think you're doing great, David. Oh, thanks. Okay, uh, the first uh, entry in our Q&A is, Alan, what is your biggest fear? I think my, my biggest fear, let me, let me break that down into two parts. Initially, my biggest fear, which I think is what informed my, my silence for the better part of a year was, um, I didn't want pity from people and I didn't want um, my, my personal networks and my professional networks to write me off, which meant that I had a lot of fear about being taken seriously after people learned that I had Parkinson's disease. Now, you know, five years later, it's almost laughable to say that because my perspective has not only been disproven consistently, i.e. It, it didn't affect me in the ways that I feared at all, but, but there is a risk. And I think we have to own that risk when, when we become public in, in an, with an illness like Parkinson's that people will um, operate from their misperceptions of which there are many or that they will treat us differently than they did before. So I think that was my, uh, my biggest fear. I think now my, my biggest fear is um, not, um, not using Parkinson's for something constructive and, and life-giving for me, for those I love and for the larger Parkinson's community. Thank you. Uh, here's another uh comment slash question regarding meaning making i believe that events good or bad don't necessarily or even religious practices carry meaning it's the meaning they find in us meaning we imbue them with uh, amen i i couldn't agree more i, I think that the meaning comes not in the practices or the perspectives, even the experiences themselves, but what we do with those, how we, how we internalize them, perhaps for me, how, I, how we talk about them in community, that's been very important to me, whether that's the Parkinson's community, whether that's um, a, you know, a church or a, or, or, or a temple or, or other kind of religious community, um, all of that's very important. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're Experiences are not intrinsically full of meaning. I agree with you. I think it's what we sort of what we do with those experiences, practices, et cetera, that, that becomes uh, fodder for meaning making. So I, I appreciate the distinction very much. And Anne also commented, I like the poem, Content and the Sneaky Rhymes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm learning how to write poetry. I don't claim to have it figured out. Well, you have an awful lot of writing on PDYs, and I've read a lot of it, so you do very, very well. Um, Claudia says, I'm getting quite emotional listening to you. You are so inspiring. Thank you. Well, thank you, Claudia. And it's mutual. I'm inspired by, by people like all of you who are living with, with Parkinson's and living well, and, and your care partners who are equally devoted to, um, to making life good with Parkinson's. My, my wife, Tracy, who is uh, on this, this call is um, as much a part of my experience uh, as anyone. And, you know, candidly in the, in the early months and, and, you know, dark periods, she was the one who 
believed for both of us that, that life could and would be good again. And I, I think, you know, having, having those people in our lives is, is invaluable, uh, necessary. In fact, it was for me for, for getting through the darkness and, and starting to see, you know, opportunities in this uh, experience that I, I couldn't have seen otherwise. Amen. Yeah, uh, I have found so much inspiration from the Parkinson's community, even though it's not Parkinson's, it's, you know, neurologic. Um, it's been a real inspiration in maintaining all this stuff. And when we first started talking about the content for a couple different programs like this, it was clear back early in the year. And this uh, tumor was the last thing that I would have thought of. But, you know, this, I feel like this uh, program is was created specifically for me. So thank you all. This is wonderful. Um, should we bring uh, Dr. Lasker back in and do a little? That'd be great. Joint? Um, questions that uh, could relate to both Dr. Lasker and Alan or Any additional comments? Let's see. Uh, if you're new in, if you're new a writing poetry in my writing, more journal style, not poetry, I find my best writing isn't mine, but from what I used to call the writing genie. When you feel it come through you, that's when it's most you yeah that's beautifully said i think um i often joke that i i write so that i know what i think and feel and i, I think there's a lot of truth in that there's something in you know in, in therapy circles we talk about you know externalizing our experience and you know for me writing is a way to externalize my experience so that i can sort of look at it and understand it and live with it in a different way so that that's beautifully put and another comment, appreciated your book on counseling people with Parkinson's and appreciate the point of putting the person before the disease. Thank, thank you. Yeah, and that, and that book, just quickly, I, I make the distinction. I'd love to hear Dr. Lasker's perspective on this, that um, I'm, I, I much prefer talking about Parkinson's as an illness as opposed to a disease. And the distinction for me, I mean, disease has its place, and certainly we want, we want people like Dr. Lasker who devote their lives to treating and even curing this disease. But for, for me, the illness frame is, is sort of pushes us to the so what of disease, right? It's, it's not sort of what is happening to us physiologically per se, but how are we going to live our lives accordingly? And for, for me, it's more than just semantics. If, if, an illness is something that I have more um, agency with, right? I, I have more um, ability to make choices that impact my, my treatment, my, um, my palliative care, perhaps, my religious and spiritual commitments, et cetera. Um, disease doesn't care about that. Disease does what it does physiologically. And so in that book, I try to make the distinction for not only PWPs, persons with Parkinson's, but also physicians and other healthcare providers to consider that, that, that distinction in their own work, um, not, not so that they take their foot off the disease accelerator, we, we need them on that, but to broaden their perspectives and their practice accordingly. Yeah, I agree. I think that's really, really valuable. I certainly, yeah, think about treating people, not diseases. Um, I think in part, um, you know, when when you read the writings of like old school neurologists, sort of the greats in, uh, in the foundations of neurology, they talk about getting to know their patients as well as possible. So getting to know people deeply in order to care for them. Um, and I think that's really, really valuable in order to figure out what it is that's important to, uh, to a patient, to a person with this illness um, so that you can uh, sculpt their care to match who they are as 
people. Um, I, I always think about a patient that I had um, who did um, engraving professionally. So even a little bit of tremor was a huge deal um, because that, that was a big part of who he was. Whereas for, for another person, a little bit of tremor doesn't really matter. And so if it's not, uh, if it's not geared specifically to the person, it's hard to, to do as good of a job for sure. One of the uh, areas that I've really come to respect in, the, in this process is the caregiver, my wife, who is my biggest advocate, my biggest supporter, and uh, no one I appreciate more than her. But there's this kind of conflict that, I mean, she is so concerned about me that there are things that I want to do then I think I can do. And it's mostly things like yard work or cleaning gutters, things like that, that are important for me to do that she, uh, she just doesn't want to hear. In fact, we had the discussion this morning and, you know, I want to respect her wishes, but at the same time, I call it practical therapy. Not only is it important for me physically but psychologically to know that yeah i can still i can still do some of this stuff so i i don't know how we balance that yeah i, I mean i think for me it's it's having those conversations you know, my i had to agree with my wife tracy that you know I, i'm not going to clean our gutters anymore you know it's probably just a smart thing not to do as much as i'd like to will myself you know, to cleaning those gutters, but there's lots of other things around the house that I not only can still do, but she expects me to do. And if I don't do it, <laughs> I hear from her. So I, mean, I think it's having those conversations, right? And and again, I mean, I think I think for me, Parkinson's is an, an experience with lots of losses and lots of gains simultaneously. And if we frame it that way, I think we, we see that happening. There are things we have to give up over time. But there are other things that we don't have to give up that are meaningful and there are new things that we can take on that we may not have ever even imagined that have their own intrinsic and um, um, other kinds of meaning as well. Well, this is one of those pregnant pauses. Are mm -hmm. we, uh, are we, there's kind of coming to a, a, there's a question in the chat that I think is really good. Oh, do you want to um, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Can I read it? Um, sure. I know, absolutely. I know several Parkinson's folks, my dad, for one, who became very withdrawn from friends and community because they were trying to hide their diagnosis. Looking back, they lost valuable time with people who would have been there to support them. That is frustrating for an observer family member. Thanks for your insights. Um, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think and I was one of those people. It was, it was not so much driven by symptoms, but just driven by knowledge that, you know, I had this, this illness, this uh, disease. And I, I think getting past that or, or sort of, um, you, you know, breaking the seal on that, that sort of privacy for me was, was the game changer, right? You know, once people knew, they knew. I used to tell Tracy when we were talking about this, the problem is you can't unring the bell, right? So once you ring the bell, people have heard it, they know. Um, and then life unfolds as it does. But what, I, what I've discovered is that we have a lot of influence on how people not only understand Parkinson's, but how they see us and our place in the world as people with Parkinson's. And so for me, I always try to encourage people you know, while respecting individual timelines, really give that a lot of thought because I think the alternative does exactly what the what Robin, the questioner, notes. It, it, it makes us lose valuable time and opportunities with people who who want to care for us in all the appropriate ways and who want to share our lives authentically. And that's more difficult to do when we're not um, when we're not public about our diagnosis. And, and Michael J. Fox again, just to quote him one more time. You know, he said he had to throw his vanity out the window mm. in order to, to really embrace, accept, 
and live with, you know, um, uh, the hand that he was dealt. And I think I, I, I remind myself of that too. It, we, all of us have levels of vanity that we probably have to just lean into and maybe get past at some point. Um, and this is where humor can come in too, I think. Great, thank you. Were there any other uh, questions or comments in the chat? I was looking primarily at the Q&A because that was a little more specific to you guys, but I don't know if there were other. I see one in the chat. Uh, Dr. Cole, were you were you ever, I know you're such a man of faith um, that's embedded in you, but following your diagnosis, were you ever angry at God or did your faith falter for any period of time? That's a great question. And I, I've been asked that a lot. And I think it's kind of the natural question, right? Um, and the, the first thing I would say is that if one is angry at God or angry at um, fate or angry at life, that's perfectly okay. I think that's part of, of, of the grieving process that, that I think many of us, maybe most of us have to indulge in some way for some period of time before we get to this acceptance, state of acceptance. Um, I, I don't, I honestly don't recall ever being angry per se. I was brokenhearted, right? I was deeply sad. I, I wrote about, I, I've written about this experience that, um, my family and I had, it was about, let's see, I was diagnosed in October and the following summer. So before I was public, we made a trip to Europe and we went to, uh, to Rome and to Vatican city. And, you know, I was, um, I was in the square and looking at all the sort of iconography and history and meaning of, of, of that religious tradition for itself and for the world. And I just remember watching my children and my wife and just being just profoundly sad at, at what I envisioned life being like for us going forward. Um, it would have been fine if I were profoundly angry too, right? I'm not, I, I think it would be natural to feel that way. But I think for me, it was the sadness that really permeated me more than the, more the, more than the anger. But I, but I think whatever emotions we feel are, are, are not only okay, that we have to own those. And, and, and for me, this comes out of my personal experience and my professional commitments. We need to find people to talk about those with. Um, other professionals, you know, a mental health professional, counselor type perhaps, a member of the clergy or a spiritual advisor perhaps, um, friends, others in the Parkinson's community. We need, we need outlets for expressing ourselves that um, allow us to work through whatever we're experiencing, whether it has to do with, with God or, or, or any other aspect of our lives. But I, think, I appreciate the question. I think it's an important one to ask. Aaron, um, with respect to palliative care uh, programs, uh, are, the, are there trainings for uh, practices or clinics that uh, would make them more uh, well-versed in palliative care? Yeah, there are different, um, there are different programs, um, I guess, depending on sort of which member of the team. Um, as uh, one of the pieces of this International Neuropalliative Care Society is to develop um, educational modules for people about palliative care, mostly focusing on healthcare providers, uh, right. different you know, clinicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, and, and physicians. Um, so that's a really a good avenue. Yeah, and I guess for folks who uh, aren't uh, working with a palliative care uh, practice, um, this is something that they can be building on their own. Yeah, I think some of, you know, the, I think the bulk of the overlap between our, our two talks are all things that people can do, um, can do on their own or, or elicit help from their community and their care team um, to do to improve improve their their own lives today, which I think is really empowering 
for people um, and doesn't necessitate a specialist. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that that's definitely true. And if there are sort or if there are specific aspects of palliative care that resonated with you, to bring them up with your with your doctors, you don't necessarily need a, a specialty trained um, palliative care doctor to to have some of these conversations. Great, thank you. Can I ask Dr. Lasker a question? If there's not another one in the in the queue. Sure. Okay. okay. So I, I know that I, I think a lot of folks with, with Parkinson's and probably any illness have you, you know, their opinions about what an ideal physician or, or healthcare provider embraces and communicates. I, I'd love to know from your standpoint, what, you know, what, what's helpful to you that for patients to um, embrace or to um, offer to you in the, in the patient doctor relationship? <clears throat> hmm. um, that's a great question. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I think just being, uh, I think bo both sides being authentic and honest with each other is super important and, and isn't very easy to do. <laughs> I think probably from both sides. So being, um, um, that's something I sort of personally work on is bringing as much of my self to the encounter as I can. And I think um, when patients are sort of willing to share themselves, what's important to them um, with me, it makes it a lot easier for me to guide their care. Um, so I think not, you know, not trying to hide yourself, who you are and what's important to you, but actually sort of sharing that and, and putting it, uh, putting it out there to, to share and interact over with your provider can be really valuable. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that wraps up um, our presentations from Dr. Lasker and Dr. Cole. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes we shy away from difficult subjects and I am so grateful that, that we took this one on. And I, I, I'm sure that um, most people like me are feeling um, very inspired by your presentations today. And we really thank you. Um, after we don't want you to leave yet, however, um, we'd like to introduce someone to you who has become a very dear friend to the foundation. Many of you may know her. Her name is Norma Murphy, and she is a support group leader, a Bible study leader, a retired Presbyterian minister, and a friend. And, and Norma continues to um, be a supply pastor in the Presbyterian community. Um, and pre-COVID, she came to us to um, see if there was a, a role she could play for folks within the community who were seeking spiritual care. And then COVID hit and kind of changed everything. So we'd like to reintroduce Norma and the topic and um, offer up an opportunity for people to reach out to Norma and uh, seek her counsel or her compassion or her support because she's fabulous at offering all of that. Um, so I would like now, we, we ask that when you contact Norma, um, do so via info at pfwpa.org or um, give a call to Casey who will connect people. We don't want Norma to be overwhelmed, um, but what I'd like to do now is to highlight Norma and allow her to introduce herself and um, speak to you. So, Norma, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, she had to, I think she jumped off and she's joining as a panelist. Hold on.
I am here. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm so uh, glad to have this opportunity to say a few words to you all. And uh, thank you so much, Christine, for that amazing uh, introduction. And thank you to both Dr. Lasker and Dr. Cole uh, for everything that you brought uh, for us uh, today. Uh, I would, would just like to highlight a, uh, a couple of things uh, about my background. Um, one is that my first profession was in music and uh, it, it continues to be a driving force in my life. Um, I do not journal well, uh, I will admit to Dr. Cole, and I'm terrible at writing poetry, uh, but I do uh, find uh, great uh, inspiration and solace and comfort in music. And my, uh, I, I have at least uh, 35 playlists on YouTube and my devotional and inspirational playlists are, are very long. Um, and uh, I, I would, I, I also have a, a strong background in all three uh, of the Abrahamic faiths. I have spent five weeks in Israel and I've spent a week in Jordan and, um, even if you uh, do not practice uh, one of those three faiths, uh, I am more than comfortable in, in talking with you and listening to you, um, whether you uh, do not uh, consider yourself to be of any, uh, associated with any uh, religious faith or spiritual at all, but just would like someone uh, uh, who cares uh, to talk with, uh, especially if you are one of those people, Dr. Um, Cole mentioned, who who doesn't necessarily um, thrive in uh, a support group setting and, and would prefer to talk to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I would uh, definitely be uh, so, so uh, glad uh, to speak with uh, any of you. And um, I, I think uh, that's probably uh, enough uh, for you to, to, to get an idea uh, of who I am. Um, I just uh, really would look forward uh, so much to being able to serve any of you in, in any way that I can. Um, it would be uh, my pleasure and my honor. Uh, and so, and thank you so much to the foundation uh, for everything that you have done in supporting me uh, as a support group leader and so on. So thank, thank you, you Norma, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And one thing that I failed to say in my introduction for those who don't know you is that Norma um, has been diagnosed with Parkinsonism and she has, you know, the same symptoms and issues that you all are facing. So not only is she a wonderful person, um, to guide you in spiritual issues or comfort care, but she also fully understands the challenges that you face every day. So thank you so much, Norma. And um, I'm now going to ask the staff to come on because they would like to um, share some more information. And I'd also like to once again, thank our wonderful sponsors who made this possible. You come in and back, I'd just add, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I just add uh, regarding Norma that she makes the most incredible chicken noodle soup. So mm -hmm. thank you. That's mm -hmm. and Norma has been bringing soup to us pretty regularly, and mm -hmm. that's been the mainstay of my son, who is mm -hmm. a very finicky eater. But he he eats the uh, soup three meals a day until it's gone. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Norma. Yes, the Parkinson's community is a wonderful support network, for sure. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, um, this webinar is recorded. You'll receive a follow-up email with the two recordings and the two presentations. So both presenters have agreed to share their slides as well. Thank you. Um, David, we have two webinars coming up. Would you like to 
share information about those two? Well, why don't you, Casey? Because okay. you are the one that <laughs> develops all this. Well, yeah, in my just, absence, Casey has done an incredible job. So glad to help. We have yeah. two more webinars this year. Uh, David has been a wonderful mentor. We have a long-term care planning webinar on Tuesday by Jennifer Rose, elder law attorney at noon. And then that's this Tuesday, November 23rd. And then to finish off the year, very apropos, we have a webinar on resilience on Tuesday, December 7th at noon. So thank you um, for attending, being present. And both of those um, links are in the chat and certainly you've received an email or two from us regarding those. But most importantly, we're so grateful for Dr. Aaron Lasker and Dr. Alan Cole. They're, I mean, amazing professionals, wonderful credentials, and wow, we get to, we get to uh, have a little bit of their expertise and time. Yeah, and so gracious with their time on a mm -hmm. Saturday morning. For sure. Well, thank you all for joining us and we are going to sign off and let you get back to a rare sunny Saturday in Pittsburgh. Mm. And thank you, Norma, as well. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.